the office of the ICT in 1996, February, when I came, was three offices, one for the registrar and his secretary, one for the senior legal officer, which was myself, and one for the rest of the staff, international staff. We have, I think at that time, we had one other legal officer, Madame Cecile Aptel from France. That was it. We then grew from one office, virtually taking over the ICC, International Conference Center, building the first courtroom, breaking offices to create offices, breaking offices to create the courtroom. And in all this, we were supported, obviously, by the Tanzanian government. At the time, we were fortunate to have, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, the outgoing president of the Republic of Tanzania, um, President Kikwete. He was then Minister of Foreign Affairs. He truly was a friend of the tribunal in the beginning. He used his, his influence to make sure that the tribunal got what it wanted, when it wanted it. Yeah, so um, there was tremendous support from the Tanzanian government. But it, it still seems like you must have been building things from from the ground up. I mean, what was what was just like the the day to day life like at the tribunal at the beginning? It was yes, it was beginning things from nothing. You, first, we had an indictment um, of the first three suspects which, who were transferred from actually Zambia. That's how I got uh, involved with the tribunal. The three suspects, the very first three suspects were transferred from Zambia. That is uh, Clemoka and Shema, uh, Akayesu, and Rutaganda. So because we had no facilities here yet, we had to ask the Zambian government to please hold on to them while we were building courtrooms, while we were building the receiving facilities, detention facilities, while we were recruiting staff. As you can see from 21, the staff grew to 1,500. So that was really starting from nothing. And nothing could have happened without the cooperation and the support, consistent support, from the government of Tanzania. What was Arusha like? Yes. <laughs> when I came, I had never been to Arusha. I had been to Da. So I asked a friend, I'm going to Arusha. What is Arusha like? He said, oh, that is the Switzerland of Africa. So I arrived in Arusha at 5 o'clock from the Kilimanjaro. Driving from Kilimanjaro to Arusha, I saw nothing but green banana plantations. Beautiful, really beautiful. So it did confirm the description that Arusha was the Switzerland of Africa. Yeah? But in terms of facilities and support and quality of living... Well, I come from next door, Zambia, mm -hmm. so the, the quality of living was not a shock to me, as some people will have a say. Admittedly, there were some serious logistical um, challenges, like the office. Um, the electricity was not as efficient as it should have been, but the tranquil, peaceful nature of Arusha, that was not an issue. So we worked very... Um, we didn't have the luxury of working during certain hours and not certain hours. As you know, we had to consult with Office of Legal Affairs in New York. And in New York, they wake up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So we worked like 6 from here. And then you got to continue working with the Office of Legal Affairs until midnight. So it was really like a, there was no time frame. You could be woken up at any time to do work. We did not have mobile phones like we have. We had uh, radio communication. That was our mode of um, communicating. But we have seen Arusha grow as the tribunal grew in terms of uh, logistical support. The first indictment, the Akayeshu indictment, was read in front of a table with the judges sitting at the back. No court reporters, no we had translation, we did have translation. So those, the, those logistical supports were incredible. And I think it is to that extent, I would I like to believe that um, the initial criticism of the tribunal being slow 
was very unfair because people didn't know that we're starting from scratch. So really, I think it was, um, it has been a tremendous experience mm -hmm. for all of us who were here in the beginning. And um, I haven't seen too many of them around for them to be also able to tell their story. What was, what was the first set of challenges that you had upon arrival? You, you, you get here, you, you look around, and it's like, okay, we've got some work to do. What was, what was first and foremost, the, the hurdles that needed to be, be crossed? Accommodation. Um, you see, um, I like to believe that Arusha was not built for an international tribunal. It was built for its own people. And what seemed adequate for the local people immediately was not adequate for international staff. So most of us had to look for, sometimes you'd go to a Tanzanian, they are building a house, and you tell them, when it's finished, I want to occupy that house. That's how it was. So mostly we stayed in the Mount Meru. It was then um, Novotel. Okay. The UN bureaucracy is absolutely incredible. And uh, in New York, staff don't have cars. So they, tra they, they generally try to judge staff here like the staff in New York. When we ask for transport for cars, they say, oh, they're asking for the world. But we really needed independent transport because there was no public transport here. Um, so slowly, slowly, we started getting support. A lot of missions, senior staff from New York had to come here to see for themselves. Uh, the logistical challenges that we were facing. Um, I remember Secretary General Kofi Annan came and uh, we tried to patch up the potholes from the airport to here. There was no tar. As if to tell the true story, it rained <laughs> and all the potholes were washed away. And he was absolutely shocked to see the, the kind of environment we were working. With his intervention again with the government of Tanzania, things seem just to improve all the time. To the third road that you see now, the modern houses that you see now. Yeah, so that was the ICTR in the beginning. So when you got here and, and you, you knew what your mission was and what, it, what had happened, so what was it like working with Rwanda? Our relationship with the London government in the in the beginning was not as good as I would have, would have wanted it to be. It took, took missions to go and persuade the Rwandan government to work with us. But uh, that is understandable. The emotions were raw. Uh, they had just come out of a genocide. So cooperation for the London Tribunal, from my point of view, was slow in the beginning. It if it was there, it is in Rwanda that this tribunal should have been located. Yeah, because of those initial hitches, that's how the Tanzanian government came in to say we will host the tribunal. Um, in time, the Rwandan government played its part, its part, especially with regard to witnesses, because as you know, without witnesses, there would have been no trials. And witnesses started coming we, we, with time. We created a witness protection unit. Uh, we took care of the witnesses. We had a hospital where we needed to give them some medical attention when they came in. Um, the, the one funny thing is that, again, I think the, the, the creation of the tribunal was something that the international community had not really quite prepared themselves. Witness protection became a big issue. Witness welfare became a big issue. Now imagine you are bringing an old lady from rural Rwanda during the rain season when she is supposed to be cultivating her piece of land, which is her economic activity. So when you proposed to New York that we needed to pay some small witness allowances, they resisted because <clears throat> you were saying, Ah, oh, you are going to be paying witnesses. What kind of justice are you going to be getting? So he said, no, we are not buying witnesses. We are making them comfortable to be able to contribute their part to the judicial proceedings. So in the time again, we persuaded the New York, we persuaded everybody around 
to make sure that witnesses were taken care of. We take them. Some of them were sick. Some of them were HIV positive. They needed to be treated before they come to court. So we turned things around to make sure that they were properly treated. Um, yeah. I remember the first old woman testifying in their Kayoso case. I can almost get goose pimples. She had built up confidence to be able to walk around the courtroom and say, you know, when they ask, can you identify the person you've been talking about? And she went and looked in his face and said, this is the one. So really for me, I think it has been a tremendous journey to come and see the tribunal close from those humble beginnings. Are there, are there other moments that really stand out when you look back at that time? Yes, especially, you know, the, the witnesses also take a calculated chance to come and testify against their own compatriots. You know, it's not like New York where you can be incognito, where you can be anonymous. So these witnesses were coming to testify with the challenge of going back to Rwanda, probably going to face the neighbor against whose relative they had um, testified against. So again, another uh, program, witness protection, giving them, um, I, uh, when they come to testify, for example, you, you, you don't show their face so that they, nobody knows who is talking. I think also that helps to assure them that they are anonymous, they can talk freely and confidently and still be able to go back to Rwanda and hopefully lead their normal lives. So witness protection for me was a very big development that helped to give impetus to the proceedings, to be able for us to come here today and say we are closing the tribunal. Some witnesses, I believe, were given, um, um, I'm forgetting the, the technical term, they were relocated. We had a very good relocation program for some witnesses to not to be able to go to Rwanda, not be able to be identified. And uh, yeah, I hope they are able to lead their lives. One can say no more but some kind of life. Um, what else? There's so much to tell. So much. So much to tell. Um, what, is, what are some things that maybe you feel like you want to talk about, you know, given the perspective of time about the process? The biggest loss to this, uh, I'll not call it a project, to this journey is the fact that it was not possible for this tribunal to be based in Rwanda. Because I think um, it is the people at an individual level on the ground who went through this genocide. And I think it would have been very important for reconciliation and for truth for the ordinary Rwandese to be in the courtroom every day if they wish to hear what happened. We had recommended, but I don't think it was ever um, implemented, that maybe we can have big screens in various parts of Rwanda so that the proceedings could be um, broadcast there. But we never quite got to that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've, I don't know if I can talk about some of the perspectives that have been um, talked about during these events. For example, the, the Minister of Justice of Rwanda, rightly, Rwanda's government would like to have the archives in Rwanda. I think that is a good proposition towards which we should work. Because if we could not have the tribunal in Rwanda, at the very least we can have the archives in Rwanda. So that Rwandese can go there, they can read for themselves what has been going on in the last 20 years about the genocide. Clearly there were missteps by the UN during 1994. In your mind, has the UN done what it can to help repair mistakes that it's made and, and to, to restore a sense of justice to Rwanda? You know, the UN is a big organization. They debate and debate, but that we cannot take away. That is democracy. But I think the community, international community did fail Rwanda in not acting timelessly when the signs of genocide were showing. I think that is a real 
tragedy that we all have to live with. That done, when the genocide happened, I think the United Nations rose to the occasion after the fact to try and repair the damage that had done. You can't repair it. We can't repair those lives. We can't repair those broken lives. But we can only help reconciliation. I do have a worry. Maybe this is a worry that I should address to the to the United Nations and also to the Rwandan government. We have to accept the totality of judicial function. The guilt are found guilty, the innocent are found innocent. Now for me to find that there are some acquitted, acquitted persons who can't go back to Rwanda, that is a matter of concern for me. That is something we have not completed. As has been observed, these people are stateless. We have found them not guilty. They should be able to go back to Rwanda if things should conclude properly. I really believe we need to deal with that. The second issue that um, would be a matter of concern to me, but again, something that we need to look into, is the issue of lack of media access to the accused person. The United Nations believes in freedom of expression. If a convicted person serves his sentence and they want to tell their story, I don't think we should gag them to say they have they should not have access to the media. Let them talk. And if anybody else wants to reply, they have the right of reply. So for me, that is a matter of concern that today we are debating whether or not there should be media access to acquitted person. There should be media access to everybody. Everybody has their story to tell. Even the convicted persons have their story to tell. Um, as a legacy, we have, a, I'm a judge of the MICT as well. And we are still waiting to see whether the remaining suspects will be arrested and brought to justice. Now, the idea of, here we have the government of Rwanda saying they, they do not want to accept, I don't, they have not said they do not want to accept. But it has not happened that a single Rwandese acquitted has gone back to Rwanda. There is a big problem there. Now I ask myself, can we seriously, with clear conscience, send suspects to be tried in Rwanda? I have a big question mark. They can be tried by the MICT, they can be tried in other countries, but I think we need to resolve the playground in Rwanda as a country so that they come to terms that even their subjects who have been convicted and acquitted should have a right to return home. I mean, compare it to the national jurisdiction. We don't uh, deport our own people when they have served their sentence. We have programs to reintegrate them. We have programs to help them settle. And I think Rwanda should concentrate on that. How do you in reintegrate the acquitted person? How do you reintegrate those who have served their sentences and still wish to go back to Rwanda? When that happens, for me, that's when there will be total closure. That's a, that's a, yeah. a very complicated issue. It is very complicated, but... Uh, and many, many of them, my understanding is, would prefer not to go to Rwanda, but rather to... Isn't that a, a source of, shouldn't that be a source of concern for us? Is, is, is that part of the... As, as you see it, is that... Uh, it's part of the problem. Yeah? When I was very involved in the transfer of suspects from various countries, like I told you. There's, a, the three, Zambia, there's three Zambian suspects, I brought them here, there was no problem with the Zambian government. When I went, we had many trips to Cameroon to bring back the Bagasora, the Big Five, as they call them. Now, they had no problem coming here because they were not sure at that time whether they were going to be transferred to, to, to Rwanda. And they were happy to stay in Cameroon while we were doing that negotiation. So the, the point is, until every Rwandese will feel free to be in Rwanda, we have not solved the problem. We, have, we may not have solved the problem. 
so that's my personal thinking mm -hmm. that uh, I hope there will be sufficient reconciliation in Rwanda for Rwandans to be able to live with each other. What has your time with the ICTR taught you? Well, it, it, it has taught me to live in diversity and appreciate each other, however different we are, and however the other person may be deficient from our perspective. That's the United Nations. It has also taught me that um, the most important thing is reconciliation, forgive, and move on. But it has also taught me that um, right under our noses, Syria only happened. Right under our noses, Kenya blew up in potential ethnic violence. So that means the issue of pursuing impunity continues. And it is very important to empower national governments to be able to deal with impunity and crimes that threaten to break out like what happened in Rwanda. There are only three tribes in Rwanda, Tutsi, Hutu, and Twa. There are countries where, there, in my country, there are 72. But we have lived in peace with each other, and we continue to live in peace with each other. So the, there is a lot to be done at a personal level, at a government level, in order to deal with future impunity. And... Um, I think the empowering starts at the level of the citizen so that they can appreciate to be tolerant of each other's differences and not to think when somebody doesn't think like you, there's something wrong with them. No, they're just different from you. Are you optimistic that the international community is, has learned from the lessons of Rwanda and has learned from lessons at the ICTY and, and that, that we're better equipped as uh, an international community to, to do better in the future? I think we are now better equipped to do better in the future. We have no choice because, um, like I told you, when this tribunal started, um, there were no precedents. People were creative enough as we went along to evolve uh, rules of procedure codes of conduct, and this has continued, and this will continue. So I think the, the international community is now better prepared, if only they'll have the political will, to deal with trouble spots in the world, and deal with them to prevent another genocide in Rwanda, another genocide in the former Yugoslavia. So I think we, are, we have no choice, but we've learned and we've been exposed enough to be able to be on the lookout and deal with it courageously when we see that a problem is brewing in some part of the world. I've, I've heard criticisms um, in, in some communities that international courts focus too much on Africa and not necessarily on other parts of the world where there are problems. Is, is, do you have any thoughts on that? I do, actually, as a matter of fact. Um, I think your question is now being asked in the context of the International Criminal Court. Mm -hmm. yeah, when the ICC was created, we were all asked to give our legal opinion. We were all asked to give our input. So Africa was the biggest supporter of the ICC. That is, there's no doubt about that. So they saw that from the ad hoc tribunals, we need something permanent to deal with impunity. Now. The advocates who are saying there is a problem in the, IC, in the ICC have a point, to this point, in the sense that um, how many years now we've had the, 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 the ICC? Ten? More than ten years. There has been no other accused appearing from the, before the ICC other than from Africa, right? So the perception is correct for the ordinary people on the streets to say that they are targeting Africa, right? But 
I personally believe in the mandate of the ICC. And now talking of Tamiya's reaction, the international community must listen why Africa is behaving this way. Now, there are two things. We don't want the idea of the ICC to go away so that impunity is given a free range. You need to listen what is it they're talking about, is there any substance in, in, in what they're saying, and then deal with it. The idea of the ICC, the mandate of the ICC, remains more relevant today than ever before. So, but there is some real concern that for us, who, have, who are practitioners in the in area of international justice, that problems may be created in the ICC which, which could lead to Africa divorcing the ICC. We don't want that to happen. We don't want that to happen. But we need to listen to why Africa is talking the way it is talking and deal with the problems. Problems are there. Why is it that people are asking 10, 13 years down the road, no other suspects have been investigated by the ICC? Are we going to see some of the atrocities committed in the Middle East end up at the ICC? So the real, the real, there, is, there is real concern about the perception. Whether it's actual or real, is it the case then that no other uh, violations which could be tried at the ICC have not occurred in other parts of the world? All those are issues that we should look at. People are talking about double standards, right? And I remember talking to a colleague who said, uh, yes, there are double standards. The reason why they're focusing on Africa is because there's a problem, but there are problems in other parts of the world. So let's deal with the issue of double standards. Let's look at why Africa is complaining. When you have big countries like South Africa talking about withdrawing from the ICC, that's a matter of concern for me. Because South Africa is not small. We don't want a domino type of effect where one withdraw, before you know it, the, the whole of Africa could withdraw from the ICC. And I, need, I think we need to prevent that. Yeah. And that's why I, I'm saying the international community must react timelessly, not the way we reacted late in Rwanda. We must act now to solve the problems at the ICC. That makes so many people think we should withdraw from the ICC. We shouldn't withdraw from the ICC. Just a quick question. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, um, after absorbing so many tragic stories, like how do you personally deal with that to, to kind of <laughs> self-care? And um, Was there any, any practices in place for the judges to just be able to get through the day? When, when I joined the ICT, I was not a judge. I would just say practicing lawyer in Zambia. But I think the UN is also very um, involved in the welfare of staff. Mm -hmm. While here we were given a lot of training how to deal with stress among ourselves and with each other. Um, I'm now a full practitioner of yoga. <laughs> to breathe and stay on top of the problem but still find solutions to it. Um, even in the ICTY, they are very good with programs to support staff. Uh, I remember um, being cancelled when watching TV, you are better off listening to the violence than watching it because watching it could impact on your health and even on your own perspectives, you know. So at a personal level, yeah, the UN is very good at that. In, 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 I don't know about here, by the time I left, it was not there. We, we had to go to the clinic um, to deal with your hypertension and what have you. In the ICTY, they actually have a resident nurse in the building to be able to assist the staff. You know, Back problems after we've been sitting for 10, 15 years, creeping, but they, they really were very supportive. The welfare unit very effective. We have speeches, people coming to speak to you about health and how to deal with your health. Yeah. Looking at some of the, the truly disturbing things that 
happened in Rwanda. How, how do you, just in the, the grand moral scheme, like how do you frame that in, in your own mind? Like where, where, where is right and wrong and, and good and evil? And this is very abstract, I, I know, but, but surely these are things that you've had to think yeah. a lot about. You know, my first trip to Rwanda, actually, in uh, 1996, I st- we stayed in the, um, what hotel is that? Red uh, Hotel Milklian, okay. yeah? You know, they, the rooms still had the blood on their walls. The carpets were um, rolled in the corner. You could literally feel the genocide somewhere along the walls. So you come out of that room and you walk on the street and you meet Rwandese, perfectly normal, really. And uh, I personally could not deal with that at a personal level. And um, I think I never went back to Rwanda to visit the memorials of the skulls displayed because I cannot deal with that. Absolutely cannot deal with that. And um, now that is very different. They celebrate every year. I don't know how they can do that because for if I were Rwandese, that is so personal. That means every year I have to break down and mourn and mourn and mourn. So I don't have that strength to be able to do that. And I, I, I could never stop to marvel at the resilience of the Rwandese people to move on with their lives after that horror. So I said to myself, if they can walk, surely I can walk too. But it's just something I could not deal with. The blood was still on the wall. The carpets were still rolled on the side of the, the hotel room. And people moved on. It's really incredible. When, when, when you're on the bench and, and someone is being tried and you're hearing about the horrible things that they've done, when you're looking at that person, are you thinking anybody could have done these things? They were just a product of their circumstances? Or, or do you get the sense that, like, no, this is, this is, this is evil, this is, this is bad? I don't pass that kind of judgment as a judge. I've moved on from being a lawyer. I've moved on to what it is that makes a judge. And the focus for me is on the evidence Mm -hmm. they will provide before me to analyze it, apply the law, and pass guilt or not guilt. And I think... um, So you remove that... You you have to remove, (laughs) you have to, to, to develop a blind spot and just deal with the evidence before you. Analyze it and apply the law. Um, yeah, I, sometimes you get, um, I got a reaction when I was in the ICTY on a case that I sat, I received a letter from the, and this is the first time I'm discussing it, um, from the group of survivors asking how I could have dealt with my judgment in that way. And uh, I discussed it with the legal lawyer. My own reaction is that I don't reply because um, what I am at home as an ordinary person is very different from what I am when I'm, a, when I'm sitting as a judge. The specific question I was asked in that letter was, how could you as a woman and a mother make such a conclusion? So when I'm in the courtroom, I'm a judge first and foremost, a mother only when I get back home to my house. And I think this is the, the challenges the ordinary, maybe not, most people don't appreciate about the onerous responsibility of being a judge. It's, it's not a light responsibility, yeah? But somebody has to do the job to maintain stability in the, in the community, yeah? Thank you so much. Thank you, and I'm retiring next year. You are.